the Badlands. What are the Badlands? Explain those Badlands. That's a hell of a name. All right, welcome everyone to this week's breaking history on Badlands Media. Once again, Gordon and I are very happy that everyone is here joining live and who's going to be watching the recording. Gordon, how you doing today? I'm great, man. I'm great. It's uh, a lot, a lot of uh, interesting stuff happening this week that uh, I think we're going to start talking about in the beginning here. But man, it's been um, kind of a wild week with the news news cycle. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, I just put I put the X post out or a few posts out on different platforms, letting everyone know we're going to be talking about the Jesuits today. We're finally getting into the Jesuits. We've been teasing this for months now. Um, yeah. Sounds like today's going to be a little bit of a, a shorter episode. I think Matt's got some travel stuff coming up, but I think the plan is to kind of introduce the Jesuits today, uh, cover some ground, and then maybe bring in Cynthia and uh, really have like a thoughtful, like in-depth discussion possibly next week. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll work on scheduling that cause that might need to be pre-recorded, but, um, man, it's, uh, it's a cool news cycle that, yes, that I want to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I'm excited about this too. And, and I mean, I partially feel a little, a little regretful because I've gotten a lot of people writing to me who had watched our previous two episodes who are, were really excited saying, Hey, we're really, really looking forward to today's show on the, the deep dive into the Jesuits. And we are going to do that. We're not running away from that, but but uh, Cynthia was supposed to be here as well to take part in that in that show. And this week uh, was is the launch of a documentary that she's spearheading. It, it just went it just went public about twenty minutes ago, and today wow. was the deadline since we're leaving this afternoon to go to Asia for three weeks of conferences and talking. So we had to get it done, and, and so it, it our whole schedules were really really animated by this deadline, and so. Um, she ended up having to focus on the the launch. We're, I'm actually be, before this show is over, people watching will be able to uh, witness the trailer. We did a one minute trailer to uh, to tease people and to help people like help get the word out that this documentary it's on escaping Calypso's Island, the energy wars, why there are no limits to growth. So exactly, it's part of a series um, of film. There's going to be about eight in that series on uh, breaking the Malthusian trap. And really giving people, um, activists, policymakers, teachers, we want to give people a sense of, well, what are the principles of physical economy that are shaping all of world history from ancient times to the present so that we can understand the relationship between the mind, the power of, of creative reason, and how it tr that power that human beings have, it's sort of the resource that creates resources. It's the infinite resource because you can. there's no end to discoveries. There's an end to how much, let's say, coal is available right in the earth but for what allows at some point coal was not a resource we were burning wood so that took a discovery testing hypothesized formation action in order to then realize that we could harness more energy density from coal than wood and then with that new power came a power of increasing technologies that allowed for more more people to live at a higher quality of life with new limits there's always limits but those limits were now more expanded we could have more of us the Malthusians were pissed because it broke their models. But then all of a sudden now we can make we can discover that oil, that crap emanating out of the farmer's field that pissed off 19th century farmers. If they discovered there was black crap under their soil, meant you couldn't till your land very well. And all of a sudden, through the through certain discoveries, that became better than gold. And you could realize that it was even more efficient than coal to burn oil and onward towards the atom and unlocking the power of the atom and, and so forth, which is, again, the sort of thing that the, the Malthusians that took over over JFK's dead body didn't want us to to tap back into that power. Um, so this this documentary series is going to go through that. But I know, like you said, we are going to do the Jesuits. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit today. But the mm -hmm. news cycle has been wildly interesting. I know you've been writing some fascinating stuff. Um, as far as your insights over some of the developments around Trump, especially in regards to the uh, the Benjamin Netanyahu situation and what's going on with the fires in the Gaza. And I loved your, uh, in the last few Badlands briefs, uh, your little contributions, especially your insight of the hammer and anvil concept. So I don't know how you'd like to to introduce some of these thoughts, Gordon, but uh, I'm going to just throw it, at, yeah. throw it at you. Where did this hammer anvil concept come from? Man, that is a... Um... Man, that's that's a really, really interesting thing about Cynthia and the um, 
documentary um, talking about energy. I was talking about energy at uh, during the geopolitics panel um, at GART, where I was saying that you know if we could get cheap, affordable energy to these um, third world countries, they could actually start focusing on building prosperity. I think it would fix a lot of the problems in the world, especially like in the Middle East and Africa. Um, General Kwas talks about like energy a lot, so he was there um, um, with his contributions. So I think that's really, really great timing that that's coming out. I'm really excited about watching that documentary. It coincides with the Badlands documentary time of deceit just came out on Monday night. Um, so everyone, if you haven't watched that, please go watch that. Um, so yeah, man, I think this is, there, there's just a lot of great things that are happening right now. Um, so as far as the, um, news cycle goes, yes. So <laughs> it's funny. I like, Trump came out yesterday and attacked and, you know, attacked Bibi Netanyahu. It's kind of being framed. He came out and kind of slammed Bibi Netanyahu for October 7th. He, ref you know, in this big interview with Time Magazine, he refused to endorse Bibi as like the leader of Israel. Um, this is all kind of something that I expected to occur at some point. Um, I, I've been writing about Bibi Netanyahu now for seven months. Um, and I have obviously, like anyone who's been following me knows I've really framed him as kind of the villain of a lot of this stuff. Um, I do think that he was involved in 9-11. I do think he was a central player in 9-11. He showed up and testified in Congress in 2002 and said and demanded that the U.S. military invade the Middle East, kill Saddam Hussein. He, he promised that would bring peace to the Middle East. He said that we needed to shut down the new programs in Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of the things that have happened over the past 20 to 25 years Bibi Netanyahu was driving a lot of that. So I do yeah. think, and, and he has bragged recently in December about stopping the Oslo Accords from 1993, which is the two state solution, like you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, and I agree. And, and just, just to say, like, he was, he was even um, before Yitzhak Rabin was murdered by a, a Zionist radical in 1995, Netanyahu was marching with uh, uh, effigies of Netanyahu calling for his murder effectively of, of Rabin. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Of, of Rabin. Sorry. Benjamin Netanyahu was calling for the, the murder of, of Rabin um, and was, was eating it up. I mean, was really part of the whole network that, that had directly sabotaged the Oslo Accords and the, the, uh, the two state solution, which nearly happened. It was happening. Um, that was then derailed. And then really the nail in the coffin was put in there with uh, Yasser Arafat's murder. Uh, by polonium poisoning a little bit later on in the game, uh, who was also an enemy, by the way, of Hamas and called it out as an Israeli-American operation within, embedded within Palestine to disrupt any type of adult conversation uh, between Arabs and Jews, like was what was happening under his negotiating team that worked with Yitzhak Rabin. So all that to say, Benjamin Netanyahu is t poison across the board. Like this guy, there's not, I don't see a virtuous bone anywhere that isn't ideologically motivated by some weird geopolitical end times <laughs> vision. Yeah. And to, and to that point, like, so Ben Gavir is his um, interior uh, security minister. So he's like the national mm -hmm. security minister. So he ministers like the, um, um, the police within Israel, like the Israeli yeah. police. So when, when you see these videos of like the, of uh, Israeli police beating like Orthodox Jews, which we've seen a lot of that, like in Jerusalem lately, um, because the, the Orthodox Jews are protesting against the Zionists. They're protesting against the war. They're saying this is, this is ridiculous. We've lived in harmony with these people for way longer than there's been a nation of Israel. For way longer than going back b way before 1947, 1948, um, the Jews and, and the Arabs and Muslims, Christians have all lived in relative harmony um, in that region for a long time. So um, Gavir is this guy who uh, actually back when Rabin was murdered in 1995, he was at one of these rallies that you talked about where they're marching with the effigies for Bibi Netanyahu. Afterwards, he speaks to, I think it was Israeli Channel 12, which is kind of like their one of their main uh, media outlets there. And on camera, he was holding a Mercedes Benz hood ornament and he was, he was a young, you know, kind of a younger guy at this point, you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, I snuck in, I, I, I scaled the wall at Rabin's house and I went and ripped this off his Mercedes Benz. And basically it was like, we can get to you Rabin if we need to. That's like, he was, he was like yeah. taunting him basically. Yeah. Two weeks later he gets murdered. Um, I mean, I, I have to think there's not a coincidence there. I think that there has to have been some sort of connection between those two things. Gavir is now part of Bibi Netanyahu's cabinet. He has been hyper hyperbolic, like screaming at the top of his lungs to kill all, all Palestinians. He wants to murder every single Palestinian. He doesn't even really want to give them mercy. 
he was questioning the other day there, you know, cause they, they record their cabinet meetings and then they like transcribe it and the news reports on it. And he was saying in the cabinet meeting, he was like, I don't understand why we're taking prisoners. Why don't we just shoot these people in the yeah. head? Like, like yeah, I, I remember that this, this interview where somebody had said, well, uh, do you think that it's right to do indiscriminate bombings where most of the people that you're killing are you even acknowledge are mostly women and children. And, um, and he said, well, look, this is hypocritical. Did we, did we make this argument against uh, the Dresden bombings in world war two against the Germans? And it's like, no, that was a war crime too. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. That was that's also a war crime. <laughs> you, yeah. You can't use one war crime to justify another war crime. <laughs> False equivalencies, right? False yeah. equivalencies. Yeah. And then you had this other guy, Smotrick, I think it was, who's the who's like the treasurer, like the like the minister yeah. of finance. He he was the guy who appeared, you know, a year ago at um this meeting um that was, you know, filmed. And on the podium, they had the, the flag, they had like a blue, it was like the blue map or whatever but it, it but it, it showed israel it showed jordan and it showed like parts of like iraq and saudi yeah. arabia part of it it was greater israel so it was like yeah. a meeting like about like promoting the idea of greater israel which re would require conquering jordan which would require conquering parts of saudi arabia uh potentially syria iraq and annexing them to become part of israel so these guys have like a very very um like it's it's beyond being a war hawk. These guys have like a like a conquistador kind of like um empire building mindset where they're gonna build their empire. They're gonna and and uh when they say to the like the river to the sea, people talk about that with the Palestinian mm. um um thing. What these guys say is from the river to the river. It's from the from the Nile to the to the um Euphrates, I, I believe it is, like up in Iraq. And they mm. think er everything those between those two rivers is Israel um in their mind. Yeah. So they have a very, very like aggressive worldview. What's interesting though is like in a three day period, I want to say it was like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you had three different people from Bibi Netanyahu's cabinet. You had Ben Gavir was first, major car accident. Like there's a video of it, him getting pulled out of the car, flips over, him getting pulled out of the car, and like he's like serious neck injuries, had to go to the hospital. Um, and then two other guys from um uh the cabinet, like the next day and then the day after that, major car accidents and like had to go to the hospital. Very odd very Ooh. odd like one of them had a broken leg i think um so i don't know what's going on there like i'm not going to really speculate on that stuff but that's like an interesting weird development that you know can't it, be, can't it reminds me a know. little bit of the um that period in saudi arabia between uh 2012 to 2017 you know, where there was a serious like a serious infight going on and then all of a sudden, yeah and you found like car bombs going off for um um prince bondar prince bondar's uh right hand man had his car blown up and then prince bondar breaks his leg or something and ends up in a jail and all of these weird things happened to people who had been very protected very high level protected deep state operatives um because there was a faction that i didn't realize existed and i hope this is the case in, in israel i really do um i i know that it was the case in the in the 90s i knew it was the case 13 14 years ago i i see evidence of that i saw less evidence that the sane adults the adult part of uh of israel like those who could think like adults in the diplomatic corps um i saw less evidence that they still had influence in more recent years however i i was wrong about saudi arabia i thought that that was a lost cause if you asked me even six seven years ago what i thought that i thought it was no they they are totally enmeshed in the deep state total synthetic construct nothing good can come out of it and here we are there actually was a sanity faction i didn't realize was there the whole time since as you pointed out and it's only because of you that i've come to better appreciate the, the the more rational dynamic of Saudi history and, and the deeper pre-Saudi, you know, uh, dynamic uh, going back many, many generations. I didn't know about that. So maybe that's happening here. Maybe there's actually some sort of a restoration of sanity in Israel, too. Yeah. So, so my my theory that I've had for a long time now that uh, I need to get like into writing, which I've been writing like in parts and I have like. I seem to compile it into like one cohesive um, article. Um, but my theory really is that what we're watching is a counterinsurgency against um, in the Middle East. And obviously that the CIA and like the Western intelligence stuff that we talk about all the time, um, which will make sense to normies if they like people who aren't into this stuff. If they watch the time of deceit um, uh, documentary, they will understand the level of influence the CIA has um, in the world. 
um, which which is why that documentary is so great. I mean, it really does like reinforce a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about on the show for months. But uh, so there's a counterinsurgency, I think, against that whole network, that clandestine network. But there's also a counterinsurgency, I think, against all the all these bad factions. These networks, you know, have a public face, and those public faces are these governments that are tr like troublesome to world peace, like troublesome in the like not we say troublesome governments before, meaning troublesome in the eyes of the, of the unipolar world order. But um, these people are nefarious. These nefarious governments, Bibi Netanyahu, I think, is like the tip of the spear for a lot of this stuff. Uh, we saw that Iran. There have been some changes in Iran. Iran, their posturing has changed ever since uh, um, like Trump left office. There just seems to be something going on in Iran. It's hard to put your finger on what it is, um, but they have shown a lot of restraint um, in dealing with Israel, where they could have escalated and taken this thing in the next level, which would have brought in Russia and China, and it would have brought in the U.S., and it would have become a big, big deal. They didn't do that. Cooler heads prevailed. They were talking to Saudi on the back channels. It seems like this counterinsurgency against Bibi Netanyahu has been coming to fruition for a while now. And that counterinsurgency, like really the catalyst that I think provoked the October 7th attack, which I do think Bibi Netanyahu was behind. I think that the catalyst for that was the Abraham Accords. I think that because the Abraham Accords, basically, for, for those who aren't completely familiar with it, is all those Arab countries that are around Israel making peace with Israel and basically agreeing to, to defend Israel from any other um, aggress aggressors in the region, such as Iran, which is what they did when Iran launched those drones at Israel. So that all worked out. Um, they aren't complete, though, because even though they got signed in 2020, the two states that got left out are Saudi Arabia and, Pal and Palestine. Those are the yeah. two that they and I think they, they that was strategic. I think MBS yeah. left those out on purpose so that he could he then tasked Faisal bin Farhan, the Saudi foreign minister, to go work on that starting in 2020. He said, go work on that and make that happen. And that's what he's been working on for four years now. And yeah. and so that all came to a head last fall where they're like, all right, we're ready. We got everyone at the table. We're ready to sign this thing. Let's let's make this deal happen. We were talking everyone was talking about back in September, October 7th happens, and here we are. Um, very convenient for people who were opposed to um, a two-state solution, which Bibi Netanyahu openly admits now he is. So now he comes out with this video on Monday, it, like this X video where he's talking to the camera for like two and a half minutes. And he's expressing his outrage because the ICCC, which we've talked about before, the International Criminal Court, which is the George Soros creation at The Hague. You then have the International uh, uh, Court of Justice, which is the UN construct that came out of World War II. Um, that's really more of like a forum for bickering nations to resolve differences. This other one is more of like a globalist weapon that they use to go after guys like Putin, people who they view as like as a problem. So I could see why people who understand that about the ICC would look at this, these these arrest warrants that they're threatening to issue against Bibi Netanyahu and his cabinet for war crimes as like a Soros like political prosecution. I view it actually more as this is the result of months and months of um, pressure from Saudi yeah. Arabia and the world really against the UN to do something about this. Um, and so these warrants are now apparently coming. Bibi Netanyahu is kind of freaking out about him, which is interesting because Putin wasn't worried about the arrest warrants issued against him. I don't know if they ever issued any against Xi, but I remember they were talking about it because of like the, the Ugar, like the Ugar Muslim, um, like genocide deployment, which who knows how much truth there is to that. But they, uh, um, they issue these arrest warrants against leaders and then they don't really have any, any like authority to enforce them. So the fact that Bibi Netanyahu is freaking out about it, what I was writing about the brief the other day was that, it's really more of a fact that you have all these other things happening. You have the entire European continent now is prepared to recognize Palestinian statehood, which is a complete deviation from tradition, break from tradition where they unconditionally support Israel. They're now saying that they're going to they're going to recognize Palestine as an as a country, which has never been done before by the West. Mm -hmm. um, that apparently is by under influence of MBS. He's been going and making friends with all these countries and convincing them to do this. You have Xi, like the reports that I've read from like the BRICS news um, um, channels are that uh, Xi is now demanding that um, Israel withdraw its forces from West Bank and Gaza forever because um, mm -hmm. they've been they've been there since 1967 um, or in the West Bank, at least. Um, and then you have Russia and, and the U.S. basically like demanding like de-escalation and saying, guys, like peace, peace, peace. Also, the U.S. is now issuing um sanctions against six different IDF battalions um, that are 
accused of doing similar things that the Azov Battalion was doing in Ukraine. Um, yeah. Very interesting parallel there. Um, so I think it's like all these flanks are moving in. And as I described it on the brief today, as like an anvil, it's like this is an anvil that's forming beneath BB Netanyahu. And really, the only thing that could say BB Netanyahu right now is Donald Trump, because mm -hmm. having a strong ally in the White House, which I would not describe Joe Biden as a strong ally to Israel or BB Netanyahu right now, but having a strong ally in the White House can really make a lot of this stuff go away and at least protect BB Netanyahu and like his ambitions to continue waging war because he's like, we're going to keep waging war. This thing's not ending anytime soon. But instead, Trump comes out with this Time Magazine thing and just crushes him. And is like this whole thing is his fault. October seventh is, is his fault. It should have never happened. Um, they asked the the interviewer asked him to endorse BB as um, Israel's leader. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that um, because he, you have other people who are um, ascending as like likely um, successors, like like likely uh, likely to usurp BB Netanyahu. And they're like, will you endorse him over these other guys? And he said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. So yeah. I think I think um, this is the closing of an era of the Bibi Netanyahu era. And I think that's going to be a really good thing for the Middle East and the world. Mm. No, those, those are very good observations. And I, I think it's important to, I, I, I like this hammer anvil uh, imagery as well. And, and keep in mind, I don't like the, the, the hammer anvil concept. It's, it's not always that there there's one specific guiding force. There's multiple different factions trying to influence the nature of that hammer and the anvil, right? It's like, I was thinking I, I was recently doing a bit of research on um, the spread of the the American system in the 19th century um, going internationally. It was coming out of the 1850s, especially after the, the Civil War, the, 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 the nationalist system of protectionism, of that type of political economy that was exemplified most concretely by the U.S. experience, especially through Lincoln's greenbacks, was going global. And revolutionary movements against empire, whether it was in... Um, in Russia and China, across Europe, uh, South America, were embracing this idea of, of of a certain type of political economy that would specifically target the oligarchy, the oligarch, it, it, not as a class, not as a, not as like every person who, who's an entrepreneur or a property owner is the enemy, which is the, the that's the fa the fallacy that was done um, with an operation that was unlaunched was unla uh, launched by uh, figures surrounding John Ruskin, the guy who inspired Cecil Rhodes um, and Milner and Thomas Huxley, that that John Ruskin who worked with all of the the, the high levels of the occult, the occult um, controlling hand of the British Empire. They were also the promoters of, of uh, the idea of imperial socialism, this idea that, okay, well, the, the, these, these Republican revolutionary movements are, are happening. Now, how do we try to subvert it by absorbing? We would have preferred that that never happened, that there would never be rebellions in Canada against the British Empire or in any other or in Australia or in India or anywhere. We would have preferred that that not be there. But now that it's happening and it's happening because of the success of what America has done, both in its own nation to keep itself together, but also internationally pr promoting not just the system um, formally, but also industrial development corridors, uh, the, the Trans-Siberian Railway, railway across Russia under, under um, the unification of Germany under the, the, the Zollverein. That was purely the application of the American system in the German context in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, same thing for France. So rail development, industrial corridors, increased powers of productivity, the increase of investment into ac academies, research and development, new scientific discoveries that would translate into new technologies. Like we're, you know, we've been alluding to that would allow for the breaking of the Malthusian trap. And the British Empire was always a system wired like today's transhumanist system, which is sort of just a, a recalibrated um, sort of modernized Malthusian agenda. Because at the end of the day, you, you could actually trace it directly. Like Darwin was inspired by Malthus, right? He read Malthus. That gave him the idea of the survival of the fittest regarding the, the strongest class of animal always destroying the weaker class of animal resulting in tension, resulting in that creative change that would involve invoke a new bigger claw or something else that would then justify why the British empire was a natural thing to rule over the weak. And it's not, it's not because of there is any 
any lies or deceit or conspiracy, but rather it's just the strong being strong by their hereditary fitness and the weak being weak. That's the, that's the reason why the poor are poor. Um, and, and as a consequence, this social application involved what you had with Herbert Spencer and Francis Galton, two members of Huxley's X club. Huxley was the controller, Thomas of Darwin, right? Who took this Malthusian idea of biology, expanded it back into human economy, right? So it's went from Malthus managing human economy into the, the, all of the, the laws of the biosphere back into the human economy through eugenics and, uh, and, and social Darwinism, which was like a false debate. It's like, what, which do you prefer? Decentralized, unplanned uh, killing of the unfit by the strong or centralized scientific planning of the killing of the unfit <laughs> by the strong? Pick one. <laughs> so, okay. And then from there, these these two movements kind of converged back with the Keynes versus Hayek debate, both Keynes and, and von Hayek. Again, one was like centralized planning, who was a eugenicist. The other one was decentralized planning. Um, both of them called for world government. Both of them were pro-Malthusian at the end of the day. Both of them were run by the British Foreign Office, uh, by the British Empire. And they were doing their debates in, in the London School of Economics to subvert the, the real revival of the Lincoln system in the form of what America was doing under Roosevelt in the 1930s by bringing in a, a real conc concrete attack on the, on the bankers of Wall Street that had been funding fascism as a real international imperial socialism. Um, and when that didn't work, they just sort of changed their, their branding again and they created transhumanism, which was, again, if you look at it, a Jesuit operation run by Pierre Taillard de Chardin, a, a leading Jesuit modernist who is infusing Darwinian systems into the Catholic Church in order to subvert the Catholic Church internationally by infusing it with this idea that, well, Darwin actually does, with the Darwinian interpretation of evolution, I'm not saying I'm against evolution from a natural design, an intelligent design standpoint, because I, I believe in evolution from an intelligent design standpoint. But from the Darwinian standpoint, there's no morality allowed. There's no directionality. There's no more. There's no purpose uh, in that's permitted. So to try to fuse that with Christianity kind of undermines Christianity or anything. And then that became the basis of the transhumanist thing that then Julian Huxley, the grandson of Thomas, started promoting um, through UNESCO and other things in the World Economic Forum. Uh, you know, was brought in, brought in these transhumanists and these Malthusians as part of the Malthusian revival, which is what Kissinger was always a part of. At the end of the day, he was the the one of the priests with David Rockefeller, who was overseeing Klaus Schwab's installation into that position as a cardboard cutout. And he himself called himself a Malthusian. Uh, 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 that was the whole idea. Uh, restore a, a science of population control under this new ethic of a, a get the world addicted to oil, like resources that we already monopolized through the seven sisters, right? And get people to fight over diminishing returns of whatever those resources are that, and we're not going to allow new discoveries and new resources to be brought online. No more fusion, cold fusion, none of that. Cut it all off, kill the scientists, sabotage the R&D. And the Middle East became used for that purpose ever since then. And uh, and now we're actually seeing, and again, you're your work on Saudi Arabia and, and the whole Middle East zone is, is fantastic because you've really been able to, to shed light on the fact that, no, there actually is a serious fight to liberate by real patriots of those countries to liberate themselves from that, that oil geopolitics trap where Saudi Arabia wants now to go for nuclear. They want to go for, so does the UAE, so does Iran, obviously, they want nuclear, but for civilian purposes. And people say, oh, but why? They're swimming in oil. It's like, well, yeah, no, I mean, they got a lot of oil in the Middle East, but at the same time, it's like, it's the price of it is totally controlled by speculators. They're totally vulnerable. They have no sovereignty and uh, they have no ability to stand on their own two feet unless they can break free and provide for something that is outside of the limits of what is already controlled. So you got this whole very interesting dynamic. And I know Kissinger, when he said, when he talked about the Abraham Accords after, cause I, I, he didn't want them. And I think that Trump fired Kissinger. That was one of his last things that he did. He actually had the courage to fire Kissinger before Trump in, I think it was November or something um, before the, the coup. And, uh, and, and, and then Kissinger, though he was in opposition to it while he was there in power in the state department as an advisor, uh, while Trump was there. Afterwards, he said the greatest thing about Trump's presidency 
was the Abraham Accords because it pit the Sunnis against the Shia. And that was Trump's brilliance. And I, I think he he painted a false image to try to co-opt what it was. So the reason why I said all of this is that the it doesn't mean that what Kissinger said was wrong in the sense that it doesn't mean that the Abraham Accords was wrong because Kissinger liked it and Kissinger is evil. And it doesn't mean that um, the, the revolutionary movements of the 19th century that were going global were wrong just because Ruskin, Thomas Huxley, and these oligarchs liked them and tried to infuse them with their own definition, which is why they created, you know, Engels and Marx who were working out of London, right? That's where they were based was the British Museum. They were overseen the whole time by the, by British intelligence like John Ruskin, uh, Thomas Carlyle especially, but also David Urquhart, who was a leading diplomat and a Byzantine figure inside of, of well, <laughs> Egypt and other places, but he was a British oligarch who was overseeing and managing Marx, just like Thomas Huxley was overseeing and managing Darwin. And it, it doesn't mean that the revolutionary movements were wrong that emerged in the form of the communist sort of upheavals, because whatever the communist movement, whatever was done in the ensuing century under the name of communism, the reason why, it, if it did have any vibe, like positive effect, and at different times, there have been positive anti-imperial effects internationally. And you'll usually find that those communists get assassinated by the CIA, usually. <laughs> mm -hmm. and But it's only because they were lifting and extracting elements of what made the American system work. The, the idea of increasing the productive powers of labor, which was with the basis of the greenback system, the idea of, over, of refuting Malthus, opposing empire, that was all based in the American system of national political economy. And to that degree that they, they use those elements, it works. To the degree that they infuse like no religion, that's an opiate to the masses, no private property, uh, let's equalize everybody. That doesn't work. And, you know, people being pragmatic people will pick and choose what works and doesn't work to solve problems based on what they know. And that's how I think determine like some of like, well, what is China? Are they communist? Are they capitalist? Is it something else? And it's kind of like it doesn't fit the boxes because they've been pragmatic. So I said all this just to get across that the ICC <laughs> is run by George Soros and some, some nefarious crappers. But it doesn't mean that just because they're they're run by these 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 terrible nefarious players that everything that they do is thus to be ignored as bad it's mm -hmm. like no they're trying to just simply co-opt something that is is there an an obvious disdain for the evil that has been done in the mass genocides of women and children especially children and and non-combatants in gaza since october 7th there is a a, a very very healthy natural disgust that people feel and they should feel and they should react to. And now there's going to be, there's pushback. And obviously there's efforts to try to co-opt and control what that pushback is going to be, but the pushback is real. So that's yeah. very important. Now, yeah. before, uh, before I throw mm -hmm. it back at you, you want to do a, co a couple of commercial breaks since we have to end early today? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, let's go ahead and do that. All right, cool. Uh, you want to do the first two? Yeah, I'll do the first two. All right, sweet. All right. Mid-Atlantic. Yeah. Um, are you paying too much for your health insurance? The high cost of medical insurance is about to get more daunting, but Mid-Atlantic Business Alliance has the solution. For over 30 years, David Becker has been helping small businesses get the best possible PPO coverage at affordable rates. Mid-Atlantic Business Alliance is pleased to announce the addition of new United Healthcare PPO plans in addition to SIG the Asigna policies. Whether you're a sole proprietor or an employer with a larger group, there are proven ways to reduce your costs and get the best coverage available. David Becker and his son, Jesse, are here to help you get the best possible PPO insurance coverage at the lowest possible rates. If you are stuck paying for your own health, uh, your own insurance, why not give David and Jesse a call to see if they can help you, help you too. For a free quote, uh, uh, call for a free quote at 609-577-8557 or visit badlandsmedia.tv slash Becker. That's badlandsmedia.tv slash Becker. Great. All right, awesome. the next one is... Love litter? Uh, is that love what it litter? Is? Yeah, love, love litter. Okay. Right. Okay. Love litters. All attention, all you badlanders with purring pals and feathered friends. Say hello to love litters. One hundred percent pure kiln dried uh, wood, free from chemicals, and oh so kind to mother Nate, uh, mother earth. No dust, no mess, and no toxins. Just a lightweight solution that's gentle on your wallet and even gentler in your home. Our biodegradable litter is crafted from wood uh, destined for landfills, giving it a new purpose in your pet's life. Cats love it. Um, our astonishing formula uh, works like magic to neutralize the, that notorious cat uh, urine odor, keeping your home pine fresh and welcoming. For bird lovers, it zaps moisture from bird droppings, crumbling them away, all while being safe if pecked at or ingested. For reptiles and critters too, our mix 
is crafted to dilute the, uh, the pine scent, ensuring those little lungs stay happy and healthy. Plus, every 30-pound bag of Love Litters will last up to six months, saving you money. Transform your pet care routine today. Visit BadlandsMedia.tv slash litter. That's BadlandsMedia.tv slash litter and breathe easy with a litter that loves your pet as much as you do. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, yeah. I mean, that that is is all all very, very interesting. It, it seems like the Malthusians, it's, uh, they're really more about like artificial scarcity. Like they want to create artificial scarcity and control the resources, which is what keeps people repressed, keeps humanity from reaching its potential. And it seems like the sovereign alliance is burning bright as coined it. Um, their mutual interest, the reason that you would join in on this and agree to like help Donald Trump take down his enemies here at home is because those enemies are also their enemies. They're abroad because they want to keep this artificial scarcity in their corner um, and basically prevent all these other nations from reaching the prosperity. They're reaching their full potential basically. Um, and up until now, they haven't really had the opportunity. They couldn't just go rogue and try to do it by themselves because we all see what happens when somebody does tries to do that. You, you you poke your head up, get it get it cut off. So mm -hmm. the, the comment you made about Kissinger and pitting the Sunnis against the Shia, very interesting. We I shared the map before of uh, that book that uh, Matt, our marketing guy, sent to me, uh, which is a great book. He interviewed MBS in it. Um, mm -hmm. But it, ha it has the map in the front flap where it, it says like enemies, like over Iran, and it shows the whole Sunni – Turkey, Turkey, uh, Iran, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Axis, um, which is like a large part of that. It's Sunni and Shia, but a large part of that is Shia and the Sunni aspect of it in Turkey is a lot more secular than the Sunni of Arabia. Um, and then down um, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, um, Syria, it says enemies or, or I'm sorry, allies. So yeah. he, that author was also pitting the same thing. And it's interesting that um, to think that maybe – Maybe Trump had tricked these people into thinking, like the Kissingers of the world, into thinking, yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to bring the Arabs in, or the Sunnis in. We're going to get them to pit yeah. them against Persia, pit them against the Shia. Um, and then the, the Malthusians are sitting there saying, all right, so we still get our conflict, just going to be different players on, on each side. That's fine. Muslim versus Muslim. We can make that work. And then you saw what happened where they were trying to antagonize Saudi Arabia um, after the October 7th attack. They had the, Yemen, they had the uh, Houthis down in Yemen like fire and missiles. They had like the blockade of the Red Sea, all these things to get the Arabs like to do something to, you know, to make, to make a bad move. Nobody took the bait. Um, Saudi Arabia kept organizing all of these um, different caravans to make sure that Israel kept getting its goods um, through, through Dubai, through Abu Dhabi. Um, mm. And so, yeah. And, they, and then now you have, it seems like Iran is actually working with Saudi Arabia. So that whole thing, that whole idea of Sunni versus Shia, that's been subverted now. Um, it's fantastic, man. It's great to see. So I'm, I'm, I am really hyped about that, but that brings us to the Jesuits and it brings us to the Malthusians because what, what they really were trying to do, like with these past two weeks, we talked about the Templars, we talked about the Crusades and, you know, the Alex Jones tweet about like, this is the real, like the third, like the one state solution and then like the Templar logo over the entire Israel, like Israel, Palestine map. Well, the Kingdom um, that, of Jerusalem logo, yeah, which was run by the yeah. Templars and the Hospitallers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kingdom of Jerusalem logo, yeah, exactly. That's what they're like. That's what they do is they get they get the evangelical Christians in in, in um, America whipped up about this. I saw Chris Paul was posting. He's been doing a lot of research into. Um, it looks like he's been looking into um, the Schofield Bible and like how this whole idea of Christian Zionism that came, came around in the 1800s. And it was like a new idea that did not exist before then, but Christian Zionism, which is being promoted, of course, by the same kind of people that we're, we've been talking about in London, um, and getting Westerners, Western Christians to invest themselves in the idea of kinetic conflict in the Holy land in order to take what is rightfully theirs, what is rightfully God's, which is, you know, to serve in order to serve the vision of Jesus and the vision of, you know, God in the Christian faith, we have to kill all these Muslims, wipe them out and take back the Holy land. Like they were trying to do a thousand years ago, but we know what that was really all about. Yeah, absolutely. No, that that's right. And it's, it's, uh, it's jarring a little bit. Like I, I, I sense that amongst a lot of the influencers, uh, who have tended to do good work, in over the the you know let's say the last 10 years uh maybe five years especially but 10 years um whether alex jones candace owen um russell brand like you know that 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 up that more popular tier of alternative media influencers um and others 
there there has been a tendency towards a recent embrace of a specific variety of Catholicism. Um, Candace Owens just recently converted to Catholicism. Russell Brand is doing, you know, he's getting baptized and he's doing um, his, his, you know, he, his Rosemary prayers I and teaching that. his audience how to do it. And mm -hmm. uh, Alex Jones is promoting the restoration of the Templar kingdom. And, and I don't even know if he fully understands what he's saying. Um, <laughs> and I'm not against Catholicism. Like I keep in mind that there's a lot of good popes. I really love a lot of them, just like American presidents get assassinated because they're usually like try to do something about the Freemasonic infiltration and Jesuit, you know, controls over the church um, before even yeah, like since, but even before the Jesuits, even there, there's been cases of really, really remarkably good bishops, good cardinals, good popes throughout history who have done well. There's great Catholics like JFK and his brother and Charles de Gaulle and, and Car so many uh, Enrico Mattei who are anti-imperial fighters. And I'm in Quebec. Just to say this, because I, I I get people who who kind of reflexively uh, say, "Oh, you and Gordon are, are Protestant, anti-Catholic, fascist." <laughs> I, I've seen all of you people, you heretics. Like, yeah, and it's like, relax, relax. No, look, yeah. if you read my writings, re listen to what Gordon's saying. We're we're clearly trying to different differentiate that there's um, a subtlety in every nation. There's two Saudi Arabias. There's two Chinas. There's two Russias. There's two Americas. There's two Britons. Good twin, bad um, twin. Yeah. Yeah. And and you've got opposing uh, currents that express um, an, uh, an an idea of human nature associated with the idea that we're, we're created equal, made in the image of a creator. And as such, our idea of law, where rights come from, what is free will? Does it exist? If so, how does it work? If we exist in a universe of lawfulness, how does freedom truly exist? Uh, maybe with responsibility and not just freedom to cut off my balls if I feel like a, a girl one morning because I'm a confused 12 year old. Um, so it's like maybe there's like a higher idea that we're like not thinking about regarding the nature of what these the, this more dignified view of human beings are that express themselves in every single culture and within every single legitimate uh, religious institution, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Confucian, you'll find opposing views, whereas the other side tends to see that you no, know, or tries to define human beings as being the purely the 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 base animalistic instincts that we part that we share with with other animals. Um, we have that too, right? Mm -hmm. The fight or fly. We have the 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 pleasure pain that that my cat has. Um, so the choice is: do we do we choose to define what a human being is around the higher faculties of these higher sense agopic love? That's not something my cat can do. It can't die for the, it could die for its babies to defend its babies, but it can't die for an idea of all cat kind. It can't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so we can, if we choose to and, and cultivate that and feed that part of ourselves. And so you'll find that it, it will express that better current will express itself in a variety of beautiful ways in Renaissance dynamics that allow explosions of population growth, new discoveries, beautiful architecture in India and in Chinese history and in European history and within different factions within the Protestant movement. We have we have the Satanists and we have or even not even Satanists. We have people who don't even maybe fully understand mm -hmm. what they're that that they are actually participating in the, de the debased version perversion of Christianity, whatever they might call themselves. Same thing for for Catholicism. Like the Templars, many of them were not intellectuals. They were there because they loved Jesus yep. and they were swept away by a current that they didn't fully understand yep. that was shaped by Satanists, <laughs> just yeah. like the Christian Zionists don't, most of them don't know who read the Schofield Bible, that Schofield was an ideologue follower of, of John Nelson Darby. They don't know yeah. it, though he <laughs> was, and Darby was a British high level Gnostic uh, controller of the exclusive Plymouth Brethren that generated Aleister Crowley, you know, and yeah, that's a yeah. thing. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's a it's a great it's a great point. I mean, like my dad's fam, my dad's family are hardcore Irish Catholic, like yeah. like fr from the Northeast, from New York. Um, my dad grew up Catholic, went to Catholic school, like still gets PTSD when he sees nuns. He says, uh, uh, he converted to um, Episcopalian, you know, Protestantism when he married my mom. 
That's what I was raised in. I've said it at Gart before. Like I recognize that my sect of Christianity that I was raised in was started because Henry VIII wanted a wanted a divorce and the Pope wouldn't wouldn't give it to him. Like I understand that there are some really silly origins to my religion, if you want to like if you want to put it that way. Um, that's just hum that's just being human, man. Like human humans are imperfect creatures. There's nothing perfect about about humans. That's the whole like thing that's explained in the Bible. It's the whole Bible is about. I'm totally at peace with that. My uh, my family on my dad's side, they're all like they're all uh, Trump supporters. They're all great patriots. They're all awesome. Um, so, yeah, Catholics are great, man. Like, I don't have anything wrong with Catholics. The Vatican has some issues. There's some issues there with uh, with just like there are issues with, with, with Henry VIII, the guy who started, um, a, you know, the Episcopalian Church, mm -hmm. uh, Anglican Church, however, however you want to call it. Um, there's some real power problems there. But that's because those are institutions of power and institutions of power are always targeted for corruption by evil corrupt people um that's just that's where the power is so that's where evil goes to manifest itself um and to infect so yeah that's a that's well said i think you know um this isn't about the the average person who subscribes to one thing or another this is about the people who are creating these ideas subverting them twisting them in order to move like start movements and move chess pieces around the, like a like a global chessboard like a worldwide chessboard to accomplish more nefarious, bigger agenda like the Schofield Bible. Yes, absolutely. On that note, here, let's do two more commercials. I'll, I'll, I'll do yep. them this. I, I think uh, one of them is uh, uh, my pillow, so it's already done. So the first one I'll do is Gold Co. Gold Co. Gold Co. Gold Co. Gold Co. Are you concerned about the $6 trillion at stake in the upcoming 2024 elections? The Wall Street Journal has reported a critical issue the looming decision on extending tax cuts scheduled to expire after 2025. Republicans advocate for extending Trump's tax, tax cuts, while the Democrats lean towards letting them expire and increasing taxes on top earners and corporations, potentially creating a massive $6 trillion gap. But fear not, there is a way to protect yourself from this impending threat. Join the thousands of hardworking Americans who, have take, who are taking pro proactive steps to safeguard their savings. Visit BadlandsGold.com to claim your free 2024 gold and silver kit and fortify everything you've worked for. You may have even qualified for up to 10% back in bonus silver, but hurry, supplies are limited. Don't leave your financial future to chance. Act now to diversify and shield your savings against the uncertainties ahead. Get your free 2024 gold and silver kit today at BadlandsGold.com and take control of your financial destiny. All right, my pillow. I'm excited to announce we're having a huge MyPillow spring sale. And here's a few examples. Buy one of our MyPillow 2.0s, you get another MyPillow 2.0 absolutely free. Made with cooling technology, the best pillow ever just got even better. And this just in, nine brand new colors and styles of our Percale bed sheets. They're made with the finest long staple cotton, and now you can save 50% or more. That's as low as $24.98. And for the first time this year, I'm bringing you our My Slippers and Sandals for as low as $25 a pair. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code to get your MyPillow 2.0s. Buy one, get one free. Per Kale Sheets, as low as $24.98. My Slippers and Sandals, as low as $25 a pair. And for a limited time, when you order $75 or more, your entire order ships absolutely free. All right. So, yeah. Um... What I was thinking about on the uh, on the issue of the um, the Templars too, and the whole like effort to revive the Crusades, because ultimately that that is one of the the ultimate goals. At the end of the day, is to reconstruct. There there is an eschatology, right? So the the oligarchy has their own messed up. I'm thinking most people probably have d deduced this at some point in some ma manner or another. The the oligarchy has their own sort of religion. Um, I, I don't believe in Hannah Arendt's commentary of evil, that uh, there's a banality of evil. Um, there's a banality to people going along with evil, like the bureau. She's talking about the bureaucrats that went along with Nazi Germany. Right. Or I what she would probably comment on the, 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 the Christian idiot mercenaries who went along with the Crusades, not realizing what they were getting into and then making a forever war happen with it, with a culture that they didn't they could have been friends with easily. And then vice versa, right? Eye for an eye. 
So there is a banality to that, but that's not really evil. That's, that's, that's people being less than what they could have been like people being mediocre. Um, so and- s- succumbing to human nature, as opposed to like aspiring to the, the virtues that are described in the Bible, for, for example, exactly, exactly. People being, yeah, n- exactly. Um, but evil, when you actually look at the thing that drives top down, the the catalyzing what you might call the prima mobile, uh, the, the prime mover, the, the thing that causes these processes to, to happen from the top down, not the bottom up, then evil takes a different character. It gets very interesting. It's it's messed up. It's super sick, but it's very interesting. It's not banal uh, or mundane. Mm-hmm. And the oligarchy has a religion. They've got a whole perverse cosmo- cosmology to ultimately justify something unjustifiable, which is that, you know, evil is good, basically. Uh, you know, that, that's that's their ultimate idea that, they're, that the, they have they had to create an idea that um, that there is a superior class that is superior because they were born into a more perfect bloodline that is of a different almost species than the majority of the slaves that they want to lord over like dogs. And that's why the royal families of, if you look at a lot of the royal families and and look at how they treat their pets and their dogs, like the royal dogs, great. They they treat them so much better than they treat Africans or human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the Dobbies, <laughs> the Dobbies in Harry Potter, that's sort of like, it's like, yeah, you got all this stuff. Why do you, why do you make Dobby wear like rags? You know, like you can't like allow these servants to, to, to just like dress normal. It's because it's kind of like a metaphor in my mind <laughs> that that's yeah, how yeah, yeah. That's a good point. They're, they're humans. Um, and they themselves are these, these special occult overlord classes. And, uh, and so they have to have a whole cosmology around, well, why this type of, of, of structure of relations between masters and slaves in society and so they, they've 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 just kind of made up their own sacred stories around the idea of a Gnostic creator god who is you know they even gave him a name Yal Jabauth you know if you read the Gnostic scriptures of the the Gospel of Seth or the the the, the, the different Gospels of Thomas and what have you which which deal with the story they you know they 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 gave a name to it they gave a name to the archons that emanated out of the great the great black emptiness of nothingness that the pure nothingness that we should all aspire to return to but to return to it being that we are created by this sub creator archon who is the ultimately you know you discover when you go i get from what i'm gathering that as you go through the rites of initiation somewhere along the way you discover that oh, what you thought was the the Christian God of the Bible is actually Yaljabal, the evil God that made the world in His image, and uh, and thus because He was ignorant and evil, thus everything He created, including especially humans, are ignorant and evil. And to the degree that we try to use our reason and conscience and moral compass, we are in, uh, engaging in unnatural perversity. And so to be liberated from this is like crazy right but to be yeah. liberated and shed free to to integrate with our true godlike self requires a whole bunch of messed up rituals that involve doing atrociously bad things integrating learning how to love the evil love the bad do the bad drugs uh, psychedelic drugs assist in that process and sacred somewhere along the way sacred prostitution which is uh sex magic yeah, sacred orgies. They got very mm-hmm. tantric sex magic crap that they've integrated. And, you know, the different aspects of this co-evolved, it seems, in, in India, in ancient India. Some of it was, I think, maybe artificially ma- manipulated while the British were controlling India for two centuries. They, I think they actually artificially amplified this caste structure in some of these more occult uh, tantric sex rituals, which were not part, I don't think, of the the genuine Indian heritage, but they were they were sort of brainwashed over centuries by the British, interesting, uh, like Blavatsky, to be led to believe, oh, I guess this, I guess the Kama Sutra is the most like you know <laughs> precious thing from ancient Indian scripture right, or something, you know, like. Um, but even the Bhagavad Gita interpretations and a lot of that, it, it seems like a lot of this comes out of Theosophist networks and and pre-Theosophist British imperial networks who are already do like working all of india like a like a slave colony yep. so that's all weird that has to be explored I'm, I'm, i'll throw that out there yeah 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 uh, but yeah like like they're, they're the oligarchy has their own very in, interesting sick technique a science of perversity 
And uh, when you look at the Crusades, it was like that was a satanic ritual. Um, and and I've read the writings of Bernard de Clairvaux. People like him for some reason because he's a saint, I guess. Um, but it's like just because he's a saint doesn't mean he was honest or like what not every saint, not every saint is good. Um, it's just they were made. There's political decisions that went into making somebody a saint and turning him into a cult. And Bernard de Clairvaux wrote the charter for the Templars that anyone can read. And it's disgusting where he does, he goes through it in the, in the charter saying why it's good for Christians to kill infidels. And it makes Jesus happy if they're, because they're not human, if they're not Christian. And so it's actually good to carry out, uh, a, a you know, a cleanse of, uh, humanity by murder. Um, <laughs> and, and that was the logical justification. Thomas Aquinas also very big prized celebrity figure. Almost he's been made into a saint, um, he also was the log the legal um su supporter. He wrote the legal um um justification for why the fourth crusade had to happen. He's the he he carried on Clairvaux's uh, and, and, and part of and part of that was the Vatican versus Constantinople, right? I mean, that was Christian yeah. versus part of that was Christian versus Christians. That wasn't even about the Christians taking back the Holy Land, that was about the Christians attacking other Christians. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, you and you bring a lot. You bring up a lot of good points. Anytime you have human beings cooperating or agreeing on anything, there's politics mm -hmm. involved. And I don't mm -hmm. mean politics like we think of it, like C-SPAN. Politics is just the science of power. That's all politics is. So anytime mm -hmm. you have people making agreements on anything, it doesn't matter if it's about sports or religion or whatever. There's politics involved, and that's just people and their inter their interpersonal relationships and the dynamics at play, and that's politics. So that's politics, uh, yeah, yeah. And so, and and you make up, a, you bring up a good point. Like these people, like this oligarchy, does have a religion. I think there's a big difference between atheism, which a lot of us have, like Burning Right, a lot of a lot, a lot of others have talked about how atheists are, have like this really militant mindset. There's a big difference between atheists and agnostics. Agnostics are just people who haven't really maybe either haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it or are just don't identify maybe with a specific religion. They believe in God and they just aren't, they, you know, they're, they're, it's a very broad, it's a very broad. Um, they're, they're, range open. Of, uh, they're very open. They're very open. Yeah, they're yes. undecided. <laughs> Athe atheists are people who are convinced God does, is not real and it's a construct used to con control humanity. And that's why they have a very militant, like, like view towards re organized religion and they want to see religion and God destroyed. I think that the oligarchy, on the other hand, they are not atheists. They know God is real. They recognize that God is real. They just hate God and they want to usurp him and become God themselves. They want to, you know, that's kind of what Satanism is all about, is basically the individual becoming God and supplanting God and replacing God, inverting everything that God has explains in the Bible, everything that's explained, you know, in, in the Holy Scriptures, inverting all of that. And a big part of that is, you know, Putting the putting the human, putting the individual above the creator, and so I think that's a big part of a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah. And it's also why they try to like manipulate society. You know, they they start with atheism to get you to to reject God and like God doesn't exist, and then eventually they can bring you back into the fold and get you to subscribe to one of these other ideas that gets you gets you worshiping anything other than other than God. Like to your, to your earlier point, but. Uh, that kind of brings us to, I think, maybe talking about what what happened with the Society of Jesus. Should we uh, give that introduction? Okay, let's, let's do it. Let's do a quick little a, a quick little thing there, and then uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show uh, the one minute trailer because I think it's actually gonna play in quite nicely to every the whole flow. It, it's kind of working nicely for that, and then we're we're gonna shift off and we're gonna run to the airport. Um, yep. Albert Pike is useful. For anybody, this is actually one of the things I had done in my early research when I was just starting to like get the like reality was beginning to kick the kick the shit out of my my illusions back in 2004, and uh, I was trying to make sense of things. Um, I, I I had a I began to obviously encounter the role of secret societies as we all encounter in, on our research, piecing things together, and the figure of Albert Pike was coming up quite a bit in my research. You know, and, and at first I was thinking, oh, the whole American revolution is a fraud because, you know, you, you get these narratives very easily um, that, you know, you, obviously Freemasonic lodges played a role um, within the revolutionary period of, of the 1776 and beyond. 
Um, there's all sorts of Masonic symbolism in Washington on the dollar bill, what have you. Mm -hmm. So my early, early impulse was the whole American revolution was an evil thing to enslave us with an illusion of freedom. That was lots of ra story. lots of rabbit holes like that all over, all over, including his, including Hitler was right. And the Nazis were good. It's like these oh, yeah. pitfalls are everywhere. So everywhere. You, know, like, you go down these rabbit holes, you explore them and then you back out and you're like, nope. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't feel bad. I mean, I was down there for a couple of years and, uh, and you know, it took me a while to finally sort of revisit my hypotheses about oversimplification, um, which, which was that everything that everything that all Freemasonry is equal. All America is equal. All everything is equal, right? It's all one thing. And I, I and I was too comfortable with my my fixed categories. And I didn't realize no, there's there's actually battles just like there is within the lodge. Uh, sorry, within the Vatican, with a whole string of dozens of dead popes. These dead popes didn't just magically appear as the pope. It required a whole network of cardinals who who were like minded, who understood this evil parasite inside of Christianity who wanted to do something about it, who were able to organize over years to get one of their people to become a, a top position. It required a lot of bishops. So it requires conspiracy for the good. And it's like that as well for presidencies. Just having a good president doesn't happen out of in a vacuum. It happens because there's a network, a process that is already in motion that uh, works together to put somebody into that or helps to get one of their own into that position against a death cult representative. Um, that's the way everything works. So the same thing for the lodges, you know, like there, there were bad hellfire club lodges tied to the United Grand Lodge, tied to the Anglican uh, Freemasonic aspects of it, which again, within Anglican church, there's good people as well who fight, who didn't want slavery. But all that to say, there were some bad hellfire club institutions involved with different figures associated with some of the founding fathers um, early on that we're like, okay, well, we can't destroy this momentum for revolution. So what we'll try to do is subvert it from within. We'll have some of our people act like patriots and then try to work to nudge it back into the empire to, to break it slowly from within. Aaron Burr being one Freemason of that caliber, who was of a diff very different standing than a George Washington, another Freemason or Marquis Lafayette. And many of them got, got killed, like especially the French ones. When they tried to do their American Revolution in France, a lot of the the best of the, the 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 those who made the American Revolution possible got put in dungeons or murdered, had their heads cut off, and only the the dark only the other uh, satanic Freemasonic Freemasons survived and thrived and restored the Jesuits in 1815. Because what was happening in 1873, one one of or 1773 was the Jesuits were getting kicked out. Now I'm saying all of this kind of in a roundabout way, but Albert Pike is somebody I encountered early on as the representative of, of the Scot the Southern branch of the Scottish Rite, And his morals and dogma was something I wanted to read. And I got a copy. I acquired a copy from a, a, a friend who I had made uh, as was a Freemasonic rapper who uh, I did a portrait of his, we did an exchange. He had, a, he was a collector of Masonic books and he sent me one of his, his, his second copies in, in exchange for a, a portrait of him and his girlfriend. And, and I, I got it and I read it. Uh, at least the last, you know, degrees from 20 to 32. Uh, you only get 31, I think, once you get to 32 uh, or something. And uh, it was very useful. But within that, he talks about the Templars and the Jesuits. And Albert Pike um, admires very much the Jesuits. He wanted to model his new societies. He was also a leader of the, the Knights for the Golden Circle, which is sort of a, a precursor to the KKK and what would have become the 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 sort of Nazi Thule Society of Southern of, of the Southern Confederate States had they been successful and and created their you know American Empire with Cuba as their headquarters that was the original idea Cuba is the center of this giant golden circle that would stretch all the way up into the uh, upper part of America down all the way to most of South America and uh, his inner religion was the Thule Society of the Nazis for the Confederates. And he talked about how the Jesuits were a more sophisticated Templars. And the Templars was like, you know, an, an, a mercenary order under the uh, sanctioned by the Pope to nominally defend Christianity, just like the Jesuits were, um, except that they were too unsophisticated and too big for their bridges and had to be reined in at a certain point when they got out of hand. And there were a few incarnations between the, the Templars getting shut down and the Jesuits emerging in uh, 1530s uh, by Ignatius Loyola. There's a few there's a few transformations that had to happen in between. 
Um, but all that to say, there is a direct connection that Albert Pike himself directly recognizes, and I think is even provable in a in a very concrete way when you look at some of the the origins and connections between the the the, the, the Franciscans, the Dominicans that we talked about, the 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 Knights of Malta, and how they were brought online to counteract or to, to counterbalance left hand, right hand, pathwise the the Templars, and how these these agencies um directly played into the creation of the jesuits especially the franciscans um directly that's uh, that's another aspect and the and the jesuits are just everywhere you look everywhere you look and cynthia is doing a ton of work for her new book as far as you can't explain the rise of the nazis properly if you don't take that into consideration you can't explain the whole confederate uh complex in america and the slave power if you don't look at the the jesuits and how they were able to infiltrate different different protestant groups even they're chameleons right so they can just they're very disciplined there's that skin, there's that there's that skin suit motif again right yeah yeah and there's good jesuits you know it's arranged hierarchically so i think the majority of jesuits don't are not in on the game some of them are, yeah. are actually on a lower level they they probably have honest motives to do good yeah. And I mean, ones... Georgetown University is a Jesuit school. I mean, they they openly have like schools like in America that are considered like prestigious um, academic institutions. I mean, are are there any prestigious academic institutions left in America? Probably not very many um, that actually like are are engaged in real like teaching. Yeah. Uh, but you know, historically at least, like Georgetown is considered a really good school, and that's a Jesuit school. So there are a lot of like Jesuit schools that are out there to your point. And I think this is the case with a lot of these organizations where you have like Freemasonry, um, where you have like a lot of like evil people who are using these organizations, these hierarchies in order to advance their interests. Um, most of the people who are involved in it have no idea that's happening. Yeah. Um, like there are tons of people who are like go out in the country here in Virginia and you'll find uh, Masonic lodges everywhere and all the good old boys are all part of it. And it's more of like a social club than anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and at the higher level, I think, you know, when you look at it, a, a lot of the, like the, the effort to integrate Marxism. So first, Tal de Chardin is a guy who oversaw the Piltdown Man hoax to try to prove that there's a mixing link. He, he oversaw the, uh, the Beijing, the Peking Man later on when the, when, the, when the Piltdown Man turned out to be a giant hoax in 1912. It was just like a, 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 a monkey jawbone or a, a fuse with a human skull. And they were like, oh, I just found it on a walk on vacation. Um, when that turned out to be a proven hoax and all of a sudden, oh, actually, there is no missing link. So Darwin's theory was now put under question again. Um, then he was like in China because he was banned by the church, which again shows that there's something good about the church that he was banned because he was such a, a, a slime ball. And forced to go he wasn't allowed to publish or teach he just had to go and do missionary work they're like just do good works in china get away and he just happens to find himself on a dig an archaeological dig and he finds that oh there's the there's more bones and it's the it's the they call the Peking man it's like the new the new the new piltdown man and they lose the bones but somehow even today in scientific journals that sold as somehow being a valid find that proves that darwin was right and that there are missing links because Darwin, you know, pr presumes gradualism from one species to another, not not discontinuous leaps. So he's doing that. He's infusing Darwinism. He's into Christianity. He's he's transforming the church into a transhumanist cult. He's also infusing Marxism, which also has a lot of connections as far as the the, the class struggle of the strong versus the weak built in baked into the system as a per perpetual idea. It's a it's a it's a problem with the Marxist theory, it's a huge Achilles heel. There's no individual individuation, right? Because if you're a rich person, you must exploit the weak. If you're a weak person, you must be exploited until a pressure cooker builds up and you blow, right? That's the nature of the, um, and then maybe at some point, some utopian workers, proletariat dictatorship will happen, you know, in some imagined future. <laughs> and so this is what, what Chardin is then bringing in also as liberation theology is being brought online to to uh, radicalize the church now i sympathize when you look at the the fight of a lot of the 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 liberation theologians of south america in the 1960s 70s 80s i'm sympathetic these are people who are fighting to defend the peasants from giant bechtel corporations run by the cia 
that were killing their people, putting Nazi-run dictatorships into power all across Latin America, Chile, Argentina, and beyond. That's where the current Pope, Bergoglio, got his start, right? What, and, and Bergoglio, advising Nazi-run governments of, of Argentina, had no problem killing his own, he's a Jesuit, but he had no problem torturing and murdering his own low-level Jesuit Jesuits in uh, Argentina who were fighting alongside the peasants. He he was okay with that. And that's a big scandal. That's improving. So they they didn't know what they were there because they wanted to do God's work. They wanted to live like Jesus, fight to defend people. And if that meant, you know, pick taking up arms, so be it. There, there, I believe that there is a justified reason, like Christians fought in the in the American Revolution. The American Revolution was a legitimate revolution. Um, that means being willing to die and, and kill for those principles. That's okay. I, I, I'm okay with that. But the crusade logic is different. The, the logic that brought online the high level Jesuits who are capable of killing for unjust reasons that are ultimately under the subservience of Satanism and Mal the God of Malthus. Uh, that's a different story. So yeah, not everyone's in on the game. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're on mute, dude. You're on mute. It has more of like the the crusader logic has more of like the the idea of conquest, kind of like what I was saying earlier about the about the 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 Bing Gavirs who want to expand Israel and see it the greater like see most of the Middle East become Israel. It's like that is the same logic. Whereas the American Revolution was about liberating yourself, like liberating your country, your countrymen from an oppressive external foreign force. Um, so yes, I agree. Two different ideas. And I, yeah, I agree that there are there are moments where violence is justified, and uh, and yeah, so I, I think we're on the same page there for sure. Um, yeah, so 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 yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, that's probably a good stopping point. I mean, like we'll we'll just wrap it up by saying the the so the Society of Jesus is what they called themselves in the beginning. It was this was created in 1541? Correct me if I'm wrong. By um, well, it was ordained. It was, it was given ordained uh, papal ordination, but it, it had been created in 1534 earlier. Yeah, 1534. Okay, then it was ordained in 1541 by Ignatius um, Loyola. Is that right? Is that right? Ignatius mm -hmm. Loyola, um, who was a Basque who comes from northern Spain. So we'll next week when we get in. Um, hopefully, we'll do it with Cynthia next week um we will uh like we'll, we'll show the maps we'll get graphics we'll do all you know we'll do the full uh the full treatment that it deserves i think this will be a good uh um sister piece too with baseless conspiracies zach and john they do baseless conspiracies on monday night i think they had already done one or two episodes on the, on the jesuits hmm. um but they but they really had a second part coming they've been teasing for a while and then they they were going to do it this past monday but then john decided to go ahead and launch the the documentary on that show okay. and so they they punted it for another week so just like us they're teasing with jesuits and 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 punting on it so uh <laughs> maybe cool. maybe next week we'll both we'll both actually do the jesuits and i think that'll be a good companion piece the yeah conspiracies and and us doing it too that would be fun if we could pull that off yeah i'm gonna like i said it'll i'll, I'll be traveling with cynthia but we'll hopefully be able to to make it all all work out some way um inshallah as they say in uh in the uh the the muslim world yeah i'll i'll like to uh, before we end as i promised from the beginning uh but the trailer before, oh, yeah. before we do that let's go ahead and just knock out rants real quick so that way uh that way oh, once we okay. do the trailer rants, we, gonna, we, rants then the trailer okay yeah so the rant i don't even know if we have any rants let me run through and check i know we, we i saw we have one boost all right so no rants but we have a boost so let me just share my screen real quick we'll knock out this boost and then do the trailer uh it is here All right, so if you go to badlandsmedia.tv, um, you'll see right here, support Badlands. Click on that tab, and you that'll take you to um, our support page. You click on Badlands Boost, and this is kind of like leaving a rumble rant, um, a, a rumble rant that you can leave, leave anytime, and it will uh, never go away as far as, as, far as I know. Um, today we have one from Kimberly Harper, uh, $10. Uh, I've been watching Breaking History from the very beginning. It's my favorite show, and I look forward to it every week. Can I ask for some episodes that specifically break down World War One and World War Two, in particular the British deceptions that played such a big part in both wars? Thank you for, for making such informative content. Oh, and I can't wait for the, quote, making history sexy, quote, merch. Uh, fingers crossed that Badlands ships to Australia. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kimberly. Yes, we will be making that merch. Um, at some point, the merch will be here. 
Um, and I don't live by shipping to Australia, but uh, I know that we have bad landers from Australia and from um, um, England and stuff. I think there are actually a few. There are a few from England and Florida that I got to meet. And I want to say there are some from Australia and Russia. There's definitely some from Russia. Um, there might have even been some from Australia too. Gasp, Russia. Yeah, the Russians have infiltrated Badlands. Um, <laughs> or maybe we infiltrated Russia. You know, you, you got to look at it that way too. But, Reciprocal. Uh, yeah. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Well, yeah, let's watch this trailer. And um, I guess that'll be it from us. I don't know if we'll do a, just a stop after that. But Yeah, uh, let's do a stop after that. Okay. So okay. anybody who, uh, like I said, uh, this is several months of work. It's episode three of the series. If people want to watch episode one and two, they can go to the description box. The full video is available if you go to the Rising Tide Foundation YouTube page or the Rising, risingtidefoundation.net that my wife is the president of. We founded this uh, a couple of years ago as a cultural educational warfare um, uh, platform. So go there. You can watch the whole film for free. We decided to make it for free. And uh, get it out there. So if you're a homeschooler, if you are uh, teaching in a in a school, a private school or otherwise, and you want to put it out there, think about like running this for the kids, getting a conversation started. Um, but until then, here's the trailer for episode three of Escaping Calypso's Island. Everyone have a great day. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Everyone have a great day. Please hit the thumbs up on your way out. Yes, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> If everybody's raising living standards to the point where everybody's got a car and everybody's got air conditioning and everybody's got a big house, uh, well, the planet will boil over. <laughs>